Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hello, and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello, everyone. Joining us on today's podcast is our regular guest, former England test player, Roland Butcher, to look back at England's recent test series against New Zealand and much more. Hello, Roland. How are you? Hey, Steve. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, my end. But um, things are fine. I'm really having a good time and great to speak to you. You're hopping about across the islands for the uh, in your selector's role. Yeah, absolutely. At the moment, I'm in Trinidad um, in my hotel room at the moment. Um, the first class cricket has resumed after a break of a month. Uh, three more runs left. Uh, we played last week. It was a game here. So obviously, there are four days. Next next run starts tomorrow. Um, I'll be at Queen's Park Oval tomorrow uh, for the start of that game. And then there's another game after that um, before we then move to Antigua for uh, the best of best where two teams are selected from the first class competition to play against themselves and the Rising Stars 11 in Antigua over three, four day matches. So next month or so is going to be very busy. So you're going to go off to Antigua as well? Well, yeah. I mean, even before that, I go home on the 1st. I travel to Antigua on the 3rd. Travel back on the 13th. Then I'm back there by the 16th. (laughs) Um, And there till first week in May. Oh, there's worse jobs anyway. Let's let, let's chat chat England. New Zealand won, England won. To begin the show, just some brief thoughts on the series. A very good series. Um, obviously, you know, England's new brand of cricket is winning them many friends and along the way winning them some games as well. But it also shows, you know, how difficult it is also to win in New Zealand because um, even though New Zealand has some key players missing from their side, they're still a very resilient outfit when they're playing at home. And, you know, when they've got players in the team with the quality of uh, Kane Williamson and some of the other players, Devon Conway and others, it just shows that, you know, even a weaker New Zealand team at home are very, very competitive. And overall, I thought it was a very good series. And the result was about right. Well, David Gower said uh, the second test was the most brilliant five days you will see for a long, long time. The big question, should England have been forced to follow on and would you have done? Well, it's, listen, um, hindsight, you know, it's twenty twenty vision, but at the end of the day, you know, England did what they thought was best. I mean, the lead was a substantial one. They felt that their bowlers could get the job done. I think instead of criticising England's performance or enforcing the follow on, I think you've got to give credit to where New Zealand played in that second innings. Um, the quality showed that they were a team not willing to give up the test match, even from so far out, um, that they were going to fight all the way through. And it ended up being a very thrilling test match um, where the margin was very, very thin. But at the end of the day, I think England contributed to um, an, ex- an excellent game. But I think the credit must really go to New Zealand for the way they performed. So you think it was more a great advert for test cricket rather than England batting again? It was, I, mean, I think it was a brilliant advert for cricket. Um, even if England had batted again, there's no guarantee that they would have won the game. Um, you know, it came down very, very close. I mean, the mere margin of one run, I mean, how can you get anything closer? So, you know, they played their part in what really, as David Gore said, was an excellent test match and um, deserves a lot of credit. But a lot of credit was for New Zealand as well for the way they fought back um, on that first innings deficit and to end up you know, getting the victory. You've mentioned him before in previous podcasts, um, Kane Williamson, who scored 132 in the second innings total of 483. Brilliant. He's a terrific player. Um, very unassuming. 
um, no ears and grace about him, just gets on with his job and, and does it very well. Um, you know, he really is a, a dream sort of guy to have in a team where, you know, he's just so reliable with the bat. When the chips are done, he's at his best. And, um, you know, as a result of having someone like him, it is allowed, you know, the likes of um, Nicole and Latham and Conway and others to really flourish um, and Blondell and others to become very good players. So he's just such a key player, not just in terms of his performance, but in terms of his standing as a man in the team, he, he's a very, very key individual. And all the talk of baseball in, in England's uh, second innings when they're chasing 2-5-8, do you think they adapted because the, the, the baseball is probably evolving? Because it, people like Root and Stokes played in a, a, a more in the test match mode. Well, listen, you, you know, test match cricket, you play the conditions. And, um, you know, obviously England look to be, at the moment, to be aggressive, put pressure back. On the opposition, you know, it has worked on a lot of occasions. It's not going to work all the time, and people must understand that. They will understand that the approach is not always going to be successful. Sometimes you're going to come up short. But at the end of the day, they came up by a short head. So there was no distance involved um, in their approach. They got very close to mean, you know, another run here or there, and they could have got over the line. And were you impressed with um, Neil Wagner in the in the second innings? Yes, I mean, Mr. Wagner, you know, he he has gone off the boil a bit for New Zealand in the, lately, but what you would say about Wagner is that, you know, he's an honest, hard-working guy. You can always throw him the ball. He's going to run in. He's going to give you 100% um, with the ball. And, you know, it, you know he, he he played his part. You know, he, he's a wholehearted cricketer. Um, he would, by his own admission, Will not say that he's the best in the world, but what he was, what you can say is that, you know, he's a guy with a lot of heart, and um, in a team we need people with heart, and he's done it over and over again for New Zealand, where he's shown that that heart um, is enough to get New Zealand over the line. And in that second test, Joe Root uh, scored uh, 150 and then uh, 95 in the second innings. Was he batting in? the way you would like to see him play at Test Cricket? Well, listen, how can you criticise the way Joe Root plays? I mean, with his record as an international batsman, um, you know, he's second to none. I mean, he's the most consistent player that England has. Um, you know, if you get 150 and 90 odd in the, t- in the Test match, what what can you say wrong with that? Um, you know, if others had contributed similarly, then we wouldn't be having this discussion. But, no, Drew plays the way that he has played for all of these years. But that's what's made him successful. Um, even when England were having bad times over the years, he was still the number one batsman and a consistent batter. Um, so really, you know, you cannot fault anything that Drew does with the bat because he's an outstanding batsman. Oh, I was thinking really he hadn't scored a test century for seven matches and and perhaps he'd, his game, had, uh, he was becoming a bit too attacking for Joe Root and he'd be best to play in the way he's always played. Oh, well, listen, sometimes, you know, you don't always score runs. I mean, there are people who've gone longer spells than that without getting a test 100. And um, you know that it's only a matter of time before he does get a 100. And, you know, it proves in New Zealand that Joe Root is still a, a class international batsman. Going back to the to the first test, the pink ball test at Mount Monganui, uh, was Ben Stokes' captaincy in the way England, you know, attacked in that first day and then declared after fifty eight overs and put New Zealand under pressure with a pink ball? Did that make a big difference in the in the twilight twilight period? I think it most definitely did. Uh, I don't think any of the sides um, really enjoyed batting late in the day with a pink ball because, you know, it certainly does give assistance to the to the bowlers. It's, it's a time where you can lose wickets and lose them in numbers. So um, the fact that England looks to put pressure on the opposition by scoring quickly and then getting them in um, is, is a perfect strategy for pink ball cricket because it means that you are bowling um, after daylight and that's an asset to your, to your team. This was the test also when... Um... 
Stuart Broad and Jimmy Anderson went past uh, Shane Warne and uh, Glenn McGrath with uh, the most dismissals of a from a pair in Test cricket. Yeah, well, listen, um, you know they're not the greatest of batsmen. Um, we, we all know that. But what they do bring to the team is, particularly in New Zealand, in New Zealand, you know, you've got green pitches. Even though they're good for batting, they're still very helpful for for the bowlers. So that's Broad and Anderson, you know, certainly played their part in the series and they were very successful bowlers. So, you know, they're still very much part of the, the England setup going forward. And, and they proved that even at their advanced age that they're still capable of doing a, a very good job. Well, Jimmy Anderson, now the number one ranked bowler in the world. Yeah, he's 40. I mean, can you imagine that? Um, I think it's testament to his longevity. It's testament to his fitness. It's testament to his desire to want to keep playing and to want to keep improving and to want to keep performing. At age 40, that you can still find yourself being the number one fast bowler in the world. You know, it speaks volumes um, for, for Jimmy Anderson. And it's an example really for all um, cricketers, all bowlers to, to, to follow that even in their advanced stage, they can still be top of the tree. What's your thoughts on Stuart Broad and his Nighthawk role? Well, I mean, you know, Stuart Broad, we all know Stuart Broad. Um, you know, over the years, you know, Stuart Broad has taken on many, many roles for England. Um, you know, at one stage, he was deemed the enforcer. I don't think he has to do that role anymore because when the likes of Mark Wood and Joe Faracha are part of the setup, uh, that role he doesn't have to take on anymore. Um, so I think now his role more now is to support them with Jimmy Anderson, and that's why you know you know England when they've got a full team, you know they've got a good potent bowling attack because they've got two out and out um, quick bowlers and then two very skillful bowlers in Anderson and and Broad. So. You know, his role has changed somewhat, but you know, he's shown that he's able to adapt um, to the new role. And while a year or so ago, or two years ago, people thought his career had been finished when he was omitted from the Tour to the West Indies, um, the last year has proven that he's still got some life left in the old dog. What about this this role of him coming in as the night watchman when he's uh, playing, as they call it, the night hawk? Well, listen, um, I'm sure he'll relish it. You know, he's not a defensive player. Um, it's an opportunity for him to come in and I guess it's it's part of the thinking of um, of the England hierarchy at the moment in terms of their aggressive player and you know perhaps in the end I watched me they want similarly for him to do to do the same thing so you know most of the other of the tail enders are more defensive players so you know it can work for the effort Your former colleague Simon Hughes was talking on the on his own podcast about a time when Phil Tufnell came in as a night watchman. He wasn't the best night watchman. Well, well Phil Tufnell really wasn't um, uh, a, a, very, a very good batsman. You, you can just say that he was um, definitely not um, a batsman of, of, of that quality. I think I think Phil Tufnell, if you gave him the opportunity, he would prefer not to bat. But um, at the same time... Um, you know, it was entertaining while he was at the crease. So, was it a series England really should have won, or you, you think it was a, a fair reflection one all? It is a fair reflection. Um, in New Zealand, it's not easy to, you know, to win um, in New Zealand. Um, I think, I think after England won that um, that Test match, obviously, you know, they would have hoped and thought that they would have gone on to, you know, perhaps. Um, either draw the next or get the victory. But as I said, you've always got to give New Zealand credit because, you know, they're a team of fighters. And they would have recognised the importance of trying that series. Um, very close game. Could have gone either way. But uh, I think overall, uh, I think the result was a fair one. Well, England haven't won in New Zealand now since 2008. And one player that performed particularly well for New Zealand was their wicketkeeper Tom Blundell who nearly nearly scored a century in both tests. Yeah, I mean, Blundell has taken over from BJ Watlin uh, and a very, very capable player for New Zealand. He does some very good work behind the stumps. Um, obviously, his batting has improved. I think he believes now that, you know, he can bat at that level and has shown in his results. So he, he is, um, you know, following in the footsteps of, of McCullum, 
um, Watlin and you now himself. So, you know, New Zealand have found a similar player to what we've had before and a very good and capable victim of batsman. Looking at some of England's performances, are you worried about uh, Ben Stokes and his knee and should he be going to the IPL? Yeah, you've got to be worried because, you know, it's a reoccurring situation where he's, you know, he's having these injuries. Um, if he plays a lot of cricket, obviously he's not going to have time for it to to heal or to be dealt with properly. Um, so it has to be a worry. Um, the fact that he's going to the IPL, you know, England is something they should worry about, particularly, you know, if he has to play a lot while he's in the IPL. You know, it may be a situation where, you know, it doesn't affect him when he's batting, but perhaps um, bowling is, is the problem. So he may find that, you know, he's doing less and less bowling as, as you go along. Yes, because he only bowled nine overs in the two tests against New Zealand, which uh, would be a worry for England with the Ashes not too far ahead. I think England need him fully fit um, for for the Ashes. They certainly need him. You know, Australia's going to be a different proposition. Uh, they, they've got a pretty useful batting lineup. Um, it's going to be important for him to be fit because uh, it's fast the bowlers at some point are going to need to have a rest. And as you know, Ben Stokes is capable of coming on and picking up one or two wickets um, quite quickly. So, yeah, I mean, he's, it should be a worry. Um, you know, if, if he's not able to bowl, I think that also handicaps the team. And and his captaincy would be severely missed if he wasn't currently in, in charge. Yes, it would. But listen, um, these are things that happen in international cricket, in any game of cricket. You know, the captain can... You know, something can happen to the captain where he's not available or through injury or whatever, and you can't play. So, you know, you know, if Ben Stokes is not able to play, you know, that's unfortunate. But, you know, it's not the end of the world. You know, you, you know, somebody else will take up the mantle. You know, the time will come and Ben Stokes can't play anymore and you will have to replace him as a captain. So, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about that. What about the England openers? Um, do you think uh, Crawley, who's failed to score a 50 in the two tests. Um, do you think he should keep his place in the side? Well, it's not really for me to say whether he should keep his place in the side, but I would sure, um, what, I, what I would imagine is that he would come under uh, pressure uh, at home from other players who certainly want that position. You know, I think a fit David Biss or for the year that he had last year, they'd like to find some um, way for him in the team. So, you know, you'd have to wait and see, but you know, it's a situation, it's a nice situation to be in where, um, you know, you have got options um, in terms of, of players you want to put into the team. Yes, if, if Johnny Bairstow is uh, is fit for uh, the Ashes, you'd think he'd come back into the side? Well, I think if he's fit, um, when I say fit, it means that he would have played some cricket and he would have shown that he, you know, he's in good form. I don't think they'll just bring him straight back because he's Johnny Bairstow and he had a good year last year. You know, he will still have to be uh, match fit. And, and scoring runs, so obviously, to get into the team. But, you know, it's a good option to have somebody who scored six centuries last year in Test career um, to be there waiting to come into the team. One player we mustn't forget is Harry Brook, who scored 89, 54, 186 and run out without facing. He continues to impress. Yeah, he's had a phenomenal start to his um, international career. You know, I don't believe he'll continue with that all the time. But as you say, you know, where the going is good, you may hear. So, you know, he's made here where the going has been good. I think this summer, Australia will present a, a different sort of a challenge to him. The question is going to be is, can he continue in that vein and, and present the Australians with the same problems that he presented the, the previous teams that he's played against? I think it's going to be a lot tougher if there's a fit, if Australian bowlers are, are fully fit. Uh, you know, he's going to have to work for his runs and if he gets um, his runs, then he would have had to play very well. One player on the co- comeback trail, Joffre Archer, after a 679-day break between England internationals, how impressed have you been in his performances against South Africa and Bangladesh? Well, he's made an impressive um, comeback, um, particularly in white ball cricket. Um, you know, the first white ball game back didn't wasn't a great one for him, but then he rebounded the next year and he picked up six wickets. So uh, his confidence has obviously grown. You can imagine coming back from such a lengthy injury, uh, you're not sure, you know, how 
things are going to go. You're always going to be worried whether the injury is going to reoccur. So it's a question of just, you know, getting your confidence back. I think once he's got his confidence back, and he's, he's starting to see that right now because, you know, he's, he's up in the 90s again. So that's always a good sight. I'm sure that England will be hoping, and desperately hoping that he is fully fit along with Mark Wood for the Ashes series. But he'll need to be managed carefully during the Ashes. Yeah, I don't think you can um, overboard him because, you know, he's your prize asset. Um, and you're going to need him at his best, really, to to, to beat Australia. Um, there's no question about that. You know, Australia are not going to be a walkover. I mean, I see some people have indicated that, you know, that's going to be the case. Uh, um, I think if anybody really believes that, then they live in Kalkogu land. Um, Australia are going to be a, formor- a formidable four. And I think England are going to have to be at their best, um, really, to, to stay in the contest. I, I think it would be a very interesting test series. So Australia's performances in India in different conditions shouldn't be too much of a bearing on the ashes? No, but I mean, Australia's um, performances in, in, in India have been excellent. You know, apart from um, you know, the start of the, of the series on very difficult wickets. The way they've bounced back and then um, the way they've won those games and then moved it into the white ball um, section as well, I think they can feel that, you know, it has not been a wasted winter for them. I think they'll come to England with lots of confidence. I think the way that Travis Head has um, come out of the series for them, um, Cameron Green, um, you know, uh, so they've got some good positives um, coming from that. I guess, you know, the one worry will probably be David Warner um, in terms of whether, you know, he can reclaim the sort of form that he has had over his career. But, you know, what you have seen is that, um, you know, Kowaja now has cemented his place at the top of the order. You know, Head's done a pretty good job recently at the top of the order as well. So, you know, I think Australia will come with a lot of confidence. So you're still holding to your 2-2 prediction on the last podcast? Well, I, yes, I, I, I would stick with 2-2. Two, two. Um, I think they're two um, fairly, you know, evenly uh, matched team. I think England might get the early ascendancy in the series, but as the series go along, I see the Australians coming very much back into the series and I would not be surprised at a 2-2 two, two draw at the end of it. Since we last spoke, the West Indies have toured Zimbabwe and are currently in South Africa. What are your reflections on the two test series they've played? I think, I think what we're seeing is progress. Um, obviously, the two test matches in Zimbabwe, um, if it wasn't for the weather, I think West Indies would have won that series 2-0. There's no question about that. Uh, very much in charge of the first test match. Weather intervened um, for a number of days. Um, so that was a draw. Won the second one um, easily. So, you know, that was a good start. South Africa always going to be a much more difficult proposition um, going from Zimbabwe to South Africa. Uh, they're also in the rebuilding phase as well. Um, obviously, you know, to lose the series, um, pretty disappointing for us to lose the series. But, you know, particularly in the first test match, I thought there were some very good signs. Um, you know, at one stage, we were very much in the game where uh, 169-3, um, you know, could have had a good lead in, in that first test match. It didn't happen and that really getting bowled up into the I think took 20 with that. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I'm seeing some progress. Uh, still a lot of work to be done. There's no question about that. I mean, we're a long way off from where we want to be, but I think we're making some gradual pro- progress and that's good. Bowling-wise, there's been some impressive performances. Yes, I mean, the bowlers have always you know, kept the team um, in the game. In South Africa, you know, that was always going to be the case. Um, you know, the bowlers, you know, were the ones, not just the West Indian bowlers, but South African bowlers, were always going to be the ones that's going to be uh, making the headlines in the Test match. Um, you know, very happy for the guys who've taken 40 wickets um, in the series, um, which is creditable. You know, um, you know, the areas that we've got to work on um, in the batting department, you know, bowling, I think, you know, so we can improve on that. But, the bowlers held their own and, and, you know, they can be pleased with the job that they did. Well, we know you're better at football predictions than uh, your cricket predictions and uh, wanted to end by um, 
Uh, you said on the previous podcast that Arsenal would win the, the Premier League. Um, Arsenal now, I was going to say we there, but I mustn't do that. Um, uh, are eight points clear. Uh, Man City got a game in hand with 10 matches or 10 cup finals to go. Uh, are, they, are they going to win the Premier League? I'm sticking with my original decision. Uh, I think um, Arsenal will win the Premier League. Um, I think Man City is going to run them all the way. There's no question about that because you know City are champion team. Um, not just this year, but you know over the years you've seen what City's been able to do. It's not going to be easy, but I believe that Arsenal um, can do the job um, this year in particular. I think um, you know they had a bad result not long ago, but since then. The response from the team has been very, very good. And, um, yeah, I expect that they will get over the line. Well, we better end with, with cricket. England have just, say, come back from New Zealand with the two test series. You still think that uh, England's positive approach is we're on the right track and, um, as you say, we're going to draw the Ashes 2-2? Well, the positive approach is, is, you know, it is something that is welcoming to national cricket, I think. Um, spectators want to see um, positive cricket. I don't think it's going to work all the time. I think you have to choose the opposition that you and the circumstances that you, you actually play that type of cricket. I would expect that there are times during the series against Australia where England will be able to play just that type of cricket. There are going to be other times where it's going to be a war of attrition where they're going to have to absorb a lot of pressure and you know and then try and play from there. So. You know, it's going to be one of those series where you were going to see some exciting uh, batting. I think at times you're going to see some dour batting as well. People who believe that England are going to play that way right through the series, every innings, um, they can try it. I don't think it will be successful against Australia. I think you've got to respect uh, the opposition you're playing against. They will respect and um, Australia. They know Australia have got a pretty good ball and attack as well. So I think they will... The attacking game um, would be marred. It will also be um, put in with some pretty um, solid um, test cricket as well. Some exciting cricket to look forward to then. The first test begins on Friday the 16th of June and we can catch up again after the Ashes. Yeah, most definitely. I think it's going to be a good series. I think um, not just England supporters, but I think there's a lot of interest around the world for this particular series. Um, a lot of interest in people f- wanting to find out whether England's new approach um, can stand the, the test of time against the Australians. So I think a lot of people from the outside will be watching to see how this series go. And, um, you know, if England are successful in the way that they play, I think it, it could also have an, an influence on the way a lot of teams play and their test cricket um, in the future. Well, best of luck with your island hopping and thanks again for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion. Yeah, Stephen, you know, it's always a great pleasure to be you know, part of your programme and um, look forward to speaking to you after the Ashes. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the paddock and the pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the pad and pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.